Hello, my name is Ken, and I want to welcome you back to Deep Waters. This podcast is brought to you by Applied Strengths Ministry, where we believe working together in our strengths is the effective working out the will and calling of God in our lives. Well, the title of this message is, This Woman Had Issues. And if you don't see it by now, this is not really about the title of the message. Well, and it is. Albeit not what an initial assessment may have revealed without first hearing of its jewels. This is a two-part series, and this is the second of two for you. So we left off at, she believed the stories about a man who could heal people, and she took from him the power necessary for healing. She noticed a difference. She knew that the devil was a liar, and no more in control of her blood. She was now under the blood that saves and heals us. Little did she know, at that time, as her blood stopped flowing, his would have to flow that all who believe could be saved and delivered of their afflictions. So in verse 30 it states, And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him. So wow, think about that, man. If somebody touches you and you can actually know that power had left you. Well, this is what I do know. If you don't have the power in you, it's not going to leave you. Get the Holy Spirit, but that's another message. So a lot of immediate lies after 12 years of straight-up issues. So now we see, no doubt, concurrently, so that as she is knowing and responding to the fact that she has just been healed, he knows that he was just touched by a straw. So in this statement, we see something marvelous. Jesus could feel his residing power and knew when it went out on assignment and when it remained. As he was walking in the crowd, have you ever wondered, If he was waiting for the straw lady to appear? Was he waiting for anyone to tap into his unending power supply? Was it a crowd test or a she alone test? Is it the same way today? Although if you see him approaching you as he walks down the street, fall on your face and be sure you are right with him. LOL. So Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? So now comes a strange interview question. What was he doing here? He turned around, so it is possible that he knew that the person had come up behind him. What if she remained quiet in her opportunity to give a testimony of what just happened? You know, just because she states that she is healed doesn't mean that the rest of the crowd doubters had to believe her. So in some strange way, she was still in a quandarious situation. I'm not sure if Lazarus was brought back to life before or after she received her healing, but we know that there was a hit put out on his life after Jesus brought him back. Need healing? Touch him, considering that all is lost without that touch. So in verse 31 it states, But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? This question reminds me of a line in Ghostbusters, where Dan Aykroyd states in the library scene, Listen, do you smell something? (laughs) I'm not sure if they just didn't get that Jesus was interested in the throngers, but the touchers. No doubt Jesus was sending a message to both the woman and the crowd. Perhaps he knew that the crowd would be hostile to the woman after he leaves, so he calls her out publicly so that everyone will know she was healed. In verse 32 it states, And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. It is interesting here that he knew it was a her. It appears as though he knows she who touched him. Was she hiding? Was she afraid that he would call her out to the crowd and tell everyone she had touched him? This is a perfect illustration of what can happen if we do not get to know him. We can believe that he is like everyone else, but I assure you that Jesus is not like everyone else in this picture, including his befuddled disciples. He knew that his work was not finished and that if the crowd did not hear his validation that she was made well, that she was healed, that they would turn against her. In verse 33 it states, But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Do you feel like if you ask God for something that you just might be stealing from him, taking something from him that doesn't belong to you? Her mind must have been swimming in thoughts at this very moment. No more doctors, no more emergency room visits, no more pain, no more title, no more isolation, loneliness. Sometimes the truth is the only thing to speak when your mind is overwhelmed with what has happened to you. Even in this scene, we can't help but believe that she was about to be called out for stealing his power, for touching him. In verse 34, And he said to her, Daughter, 
your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Okay, so there are four things of interest regarding what Jesus just said to her. So the first is daughter. It is implied here that she was saved as she is now being addressed as a daughter of God. There is a good point to be made here, which is if you receive something from God, then it is also a good opportunity to seek salvation. The supernatural manifestation of healing, deliverance, miracles, signs and wonders can create momentum that can launch you into his arms. You see, Jesus didn't see some strange woman in the throng crowd. Nope. He saw his daughter, one of his kids. Listen, you are a child of God, and he wants to give you every heavenly benefit that he has. Approach him as if you know without any doubt that you are a son or a daughter of God. Now, of course, she didn't know this up front, or that what he was really trying to do was protect her from the crowd. You know, crowds are always just one idiot away from a poisonous group think. Here, they are thinking a circus has come into town, and right under their noses, she steals heavenly power and goes away with the biggest stuffed animal. The second thing, your faith has made you well. Now, he is confirming what she already felt in her body. Now, this must have been a strange thing that she was wrestling with, as she had pretty much been used to feeling crappy for 12 years, and now she was feeling great. Isn't God so lovely as he addresses even our fear in the midst of activated faith? This also tells us that there may be a fear, an emotional response to a God moment that is not a spirit of fear, but comes out of a reaction to what God just did to us. Her fear didn't place her back in bondage, just saying. The third thing he said was go in peace. When the Prince of Peace tells you to go in peace, just know that you can be in absolute peace. Any of her fears as to the crowd response is laid to rest in Jesus' proclamation, go in peace. Oh, there's so much going on in this story. So the last thing he said in that verse, be healed of your affliction. Now this threw me off a bit because she knew she was healed. He stated she was made well by her faith, and yet he says, be healed of your affliction. I looked this up in my Jimmy Swagger's signature Bible that my dad left me, and he states that the malady would never return, which is helpful because it sounded like Jesus was being repetitive. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, Some from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So I included this section of scripture as it departs from the story of the daughter, because I want you to catch a glimpse of the disease of being religious without having the power of God to help others. Additionally, we see how those who lack faith and authority to excuse the man from seeing Jesus, because as we know, religious people are very presumptuous. They miss the entirety of the woman event. Did they think she was too unclean to be around? Were they not impressed that God was coming to town? Or unlike the woman, did their faith end as soon as the issue hit the realm of the impossible, in their minds, of course? What is strange is that they were in the house, not the crowd. Additionally, they still called him a teacher, although this could actually mean that they only saw him as a teacher and not the Son of God. This would also explain why they were in the house. Now you might be thinking, yes... But they may have been watching from their windows. And my reply would be, yes, it is possible because we have many Christians watching Jesus from their windows. You know, if it maddens you, then it is you that this is referring to. For your sake, at least get into the crowd. But you know that the best position to be in is to become a thief of his power. Get yours and then give it to others. Well, that's it for today and for this message series. I want to encourage you by sharing that a meal is always better when you have the appetite for it. If you have an appetite for God, then pull up to the table and eat. If you don't but want it, then go after Him and get your born-again experience, as if all your future and eternity depended upon it, because in truth, it does. Now, if you feel that you are a believer but don't have the appetite for such a meal, then start with lighter meals, the milk of the Word, then progress to the bread of life meal. Surely this will soon afterward increase your appetite for the meat of the Word, and for the face-to-face encounters with God that you so desire. Remember, it's not what you find wrong with or disagree with regarding these messages, but what you can take away from it. Together we can do more to impact the kingdom than if we work alone. Let's flip the script and kill, still, and destroy the works of the enemy and create space for the light of lights to shine through into people's lives. Find a seat and click on the like and subscribe buttons. Let's build this ministry together. Thanks and see you next time in deep waters.